cars like this Lamborghini Sesto Elemento are the standard at every auto show, including the 2010 Paris Motor Show. Designers were able to get the weight on this model below 1,000 kilograms. The chassis and the drive shaft are made of carbon fiber. It might be hard to believe, but this high-tech vehicle can accelerate from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in just 2.5 seconds. Manufacturers such as Zayat, which are focused on mass production, value other criteria. Zayat's IBE, which is also quite optically exciting, gives us a hint of what future everyday vehicles will look like. This sports car has an electric motor only. With its aero design, triangles dominate the form, setting the tone today for Seat models in the future. The interior, on the other hand, is completely minimalistic. Almost all car makers are offering some type of electric drive, most developed from an existing model. Mercedes presents its A-Class here as the E-Cell, a five-door hatchback. With its two lithium cell battery packs from partner firm Tesla, this vehicle has a range of more than 200 kilometers. Joachim Schmidt from Mercedes says this A-Class is a zero emissions vehicle and is one of the company's highlight presentations in Paris. Since the beginning of the year, the company has delivered about 1,000 smart cars with electric drive. Schmidt says Mercedes is also delivering B-Class cars with hydrogen fuel cells, giving the company hydrogen fuel cells as well as electric drive and hybrid engines. The S-Class, for example, has been offered with a hybrid engine for some time, and next year Mercedes will bring other hybrid models onto the market. Hyundai presented the iX20, its European-designed and manufactured minivan. The blue version has reduced CO2 emissions and better fuel efficiency. That's accomplished through improved aerodynamics, a start-stop system from Bosch, reduced resistance light tires, and fuel efficiency optimized engine management. It also has a newly constructed lower consumption six-speed engine with shift indicator. With the green E-Line, Skoda put forward for the first time a purely electric drive vehicle. It's based on Skoda's Octavia station wagon. The modular components of the Octavia allow for easy installation of batteries, electronic drive control, and the motor. The Octavia green E-Line can accelerate from 0 to 100 in 12 seconds, and it has a maximum speed of 135 kilometers per hour. Volvo begins production of its electric model, the C30 Drive Electric, next year. The sporty compact has a range of about 150 kilometers. It can accelerate to 100 kilometers an hour in 10 and a half seconds and has a top speed of 130. Test vehicles are already on the road in Europe, China, and the U.S. Olaf Might from Volvo says the Swedish car maker has a three-step plan. First part of the plan is already reality. Volvo offers extra fuel-efficient diesel models under the Drive E name. The next step is the introduction of a plug-in hybrid in 2012. And the third step is complete electrification. Peugeot is set on hybrid all-wheel drive. The Hybrid 4 technology, as it's called, allows pure electric drive at low speeds for distances up to two and a half kilometers. Peugeot is aiming at the European markets with the diesel hybrid. Thomas Ball from Peugeot says this electric drive is strongly focused on metropolitan and urban areas, and the ranges involved are very much for city driving. Diesel hybrids naturally offer unlimited ranges as well, and therefore can be used in a variety of situations. Even the super sports cars are no longer just about performance and are now also being offered with alternative drive models. The Jaguar CX-75 has four electric motors, one at each wheel for a combined 780 horsepower, from 0 to 300 kilometers an hour in an incredible 15.7 seconds. 
Two micro gas turbines can charge the batteries while the car is underway. Spanish car maker Seat has introduced an updated version of its family van, the Seat Alhambra. The relationship to Volkswagen Charan is unmistakable, but the Alhambra is more than 1,000 euros cheaper than its VW sibling. Rolf Dielenschneider from Seat says the company offers incredible value for money in Germany and they are aiming for a special group of customers, namely large customers operating commercial fleets. He says Seat has special offers with a cost of ownership of 14 cents per kilometer and for fleet managers that has to be a convincing argument. Good value for money is something families could also appreciate in the Alhambra. At first glance, the Seat Alhambra and the VW Charan seem like they are cut from the same cloth. Except for the logo, grille, and tail lights, they're nearly identical. The Alhambra is nice to look at. The sharp-edged headlights give a sporty, almost aggressive air. The sliding rear side doors are very practical, making loading especially easy, even in tight parking situations. The tail lights are large, but elegantly flow into the overall design. Functionality is the watchword in the interior. The instrument panel is clearly organized. Electrically adjustable seats are nice on longer trips. The Alhambra's easy fold seat concept is especially practical and surprisingly easy to adjust. With just a few movements and without much effort, all the storage area converts into an additional two seats. And storing the extra seats to get that storage space back is even easier. Seat also has strong performance and environmental statistics. Wolf Dielen Schneider says all engines fulfill EU Euro 5 emission standards and include start-stop technology and regenerative braking systems. In other words, they're completely state-of-the-art. Emissions of 143 grams of CO2 per kilometer weren't even possible in this class of vehicle in the past, and now we're leading there as well, he says. Seat is ahead of others in the class, and our test drive showed that as well. We drove an Alhambra equipped with a 2-liter diesel 140-horsepower engine. Seat's estimated fuel consumption, 5.7 liters per 100 kilometers. This Alhambra could accelerate from 0 to 100 in just 10.9 seconds and has a max speed of 191 kilometers an hour. We tested a model with the style package, which has a purchase price starting at 33,800 euros in Germany. The basic version of the Seat Alhambra with a 1.4 liter gasoline engine and five seats starts at 27,500 euros. The Intermont motorcycle, scooter and bicycle fair came to Cologne last week. One of the highlights was BMW's KT 1600, the first BMW motorcycle powered by an inline six-cylinder engine. The technology-loaded 160-horsepower luxury touring bike is expected to go on sale in early 2011. Suzuki rolled out three new models, including the extensively restyled GSX-R600 and the new GSR-X750, which has lost 8 kilos. Peugeot presented its new E-Viva City, a tiny little electric scooter that gets by with just 5.5 horsepower and needs just 5 hours to completely recharge. It has a range of 60 kilometers.
Horex is back. The legendary German brand has been brought back to life 50 years after the original company was bought up and shut down by Daimler. The new 200 horsepower Horex is expected to cost around 20,000 euros when it goes on sale sometime next year. The new Ford Focus is a real sports car. With its performance numbers, traction and precise steering, it can compete with cars that are much more exotic. Race driver Patrick Zimon is reading from a Ford press release and thinks Ford lays it on pretty heavy. So let's join Patrick while he sees whether the Focus RS lives up to the hype. The RS produces 305 horsepower and a whopping 440 newton meters of torque. Big numbers for a front drive car. Normally, Patrick tells us front drive cars have a reputation for tons of understeer. When you come out of a curve, the wheels spin and everything goes up in smoke. But up here in the French Maritime Alps, Patrick says he can't detect any of that. To reduce torque steer and increase the 19-inch tire's grip, Ford has introduced a front axle from the WRC Rally Focus, combined with a limited slip differential. Patrick says the result really works. The driver feels the steering wheel tugging a little, but that's good feedback from the front wheel's grip. He compares it to the seat of the pants feedback a rear drive car delivers, but without the spinning wheels. And when the road gets really twisty, Patrick says the Ford is just a blast. The combination, the suspension, the sounds, the turbos whisper when you ease up going into a curve, and the roar when you step on it again. Patrick says he wants to stop talking about it and wants to just focus on whipping the car through the curves. The RS not only looks like a relic from another time, it sounds like one, too. Patrick says you can drive it hundreds of kilometers, just giving gas and listening. It's just so cool, says Patrick. Patrick says Ford's RS logo stands for Rally Sport and that the company can look back on 40 years of rally history. It all started in 1970 with the Escort RS 1600, a successful competitor on the Rally Sport circuit. The first street version of the Escort RS appeared in 1973. The RS 200 for the Rally World Championships had a mid-engine and 370 horsepower. The early 90s brought the Cosworth and the huge wing. The first Focus RS was understated and rare, with just 4,500 units built. That exclusivity is to be continued with a new RS. Only 1,000 units are to be sold in Germany at 33,900 euros each. For that, the customer gets a Focus that's been souped up to the limit. The car is five centimeters wider than a standard Focus. The wing helps provide enough downforce at top speed, which Ford says is 263 kilometers an hour. Most of the interior is straight out of the regular Focus, except for the speedometer, which tops out at 280, and the Recaro seats for adequate support when throwing the car through curves. But now Patrick says he's going to let a real rally driver show us what a professional can do with a Focus RS. Ford has been involved in rally racing for 40 years and won its last championship in 2007. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I want to drive. Are you sure? It's a very powerful car. I'm sure I can handle it. Okay. Wenn er meint. Patrick introduces Miko Hirvonen. He's a driver for Ford's factory team. And if anyone can handle the new Focus, Miko's it. But Patrick doesn't want to miss any of the fun. Okay, let's go. Miko, how much rally car is in the new Focus RS? 
there is a lot of similarities. I mean, if you just look at the car, there's a really big rear spoiler. It feels really responsive with the engine. So uh, just the handling. I mean, if you compare this car to a rally car when we are driving on tarmac, the preciseness of the handling, it's, it's very similar. So I write down now some notes. So um, please, uh, we, we're gonna we're gonna change now to rally speed uh, and check if the notes are right. Let's see if you can stay in the notes. Oh, but I better tell nothing. Oh, impressive. Ooh. Now you should be talking all the time, telling yeah, me what's coming. Easy left into uh, uh, midway right, uh, f flat. No, no, no. Uh, Tight break, break. Break. Oh. And rock inside. Ro okay, rock inside. That's all I need to know. Rock inside means rock and roll. <laughs> then Patrick takes the wheel again. and answers the original question. Is the Ford Focus RS a legitimate sports car? For Patrick, the answer is a no-brainer. It's a full-blooded 100% sports car. And it's available not only in neon green, but also in white and blue. But now Patrick tells us to leave him alone and let him concentrate on driving this car a little more. The Norwegian capital is one of the greenest cities in the world. That's why it was chosen to host the 2010 Zero Emission Rally, a three-day, 750-kilometer road race through Norway, in which participants release no carbon dioxide emissions. Norway produces much of its electricity from hydroelectric plants, which means much of the electricity coming out of power sockets is also clean. Three classes of vehicles were entered in the rally hybrid vehicles, electric vehicles, and hydrogen drive vehicles. Over the last decade, the network of filling stations that provide hydrogen has been growing. Drivers can fill their cars just as they would with gasoline. Electric cars, on the other hand, just need a power cord and normal electricity socket. Efficiency is as much a goal as speed in this rally vehicles are required to adhere to a predetermined average speed. Participants who arrive too late or too early suffer time penalties. Drivers were impressed at the strides the technology has made. The acceleration in the car is amazing because uh, the electric uh, system so is uh, a lot of torque so straight away uh, fast and I think uh, 0 to 100 is 3.9 seconds or something so that's good. Over the next 20 years, I think maybe it will be uh, good with the electric cars, especially in the city. The first test is a slalom course that tests the driver's skills. The electric cars have an advantage here because they're often designed to be nimble at speeds under 60 kilometers an hour. After that comes a go-kart track. Today I drive an electric uh, sports car, impressive, and it's faster than the, even the fastest Porsche from 0 to 60. I think this evolution will surprise us. Maybe next year, in two years, an electric car will be much more common. Not today. Because now they are more, uh, more usable, they have a, more practical in daily use. To charge this car for uh, 350 kilometers, you just connect it. Easy like to plug in my you know, guitar in a guitar amp. It's no problem. The go-kart track is tight and demanding. The drivers are curious to see how their cars will handle the course. Well, my name is Mats Østberg. I'm from uh, from Norway. This is also a very nice thing to do, like a rally with a with a electrical car. I think it's just superb. Uh, I think definitely it's the future, and I think uh, it's it's. I don't think everyone knows that it's actually possible to use an electrical car every day for everyday use, but that's absolutely possible. 
On the next day, drivers head out into Norway's beautiful countryside. Two mobile charging stations are also underway to help any cars that unexpectedly run out of juice. The final stage starts early in the morning. On this day, the route includes a difficult mountain pass. The goal is to keep energy consumption as steady as possible, which is not so easy going uphill. The descent, however, is more relaxing and enables the drivers to admire the dramatic views. When it's all over, Mats Ostberg is the winner and is Tesla Roadster king of the electrics. You know, we had the, the time thing today where you go on the average speed, which I think is the most difficult. I like the flat out thing much better. So we was really nervous, tried to plan everything and do everything perfect, but in the end it gave us uh, quite a good uh, point score and it helped us win, so I'm, I'm really, really happy with that. Quality costs money for jets as well as cars. That's why the engineers at BMW are sparing no cost to produce the highest quality possible in Series 1600. At BMW, quality means good handling. Comfortable road control. High speed and, of course, proper braking. Quality also means road grip and modern suspension. And for those who love speed, there's the BMW 1600 Ti model. The 1968 BMW 1600 Ti is our test candidate, a car of international fame. It was built as a series touring car, with few optical differences from the regular production model. Rally driver Arvid Hafner isn't shocked that only 32 models are still registered. He values other aspects about his BMW. He says we drive parts of the European Championship runs for historical vehicles. This fulfills the appropriate sporting regulations, and that's why the series model looks the way it does. This is a touring car with very few modifications. The tuned four-cylinder engine produces 150 horsepower with just 1.6 liters. The interior shows a mix of touring car and series model. The beautiful original details are preserved. Before hitting the race circuit, Arvid Hafner enjoys a warm-up phase for himself and his BMW on the slalom course. With lowered steel springs and fitted shocks, the 1600 confidently negotiates the pylons. It's clear Arvid Hafner has control of the vehicle. The thrills of the test track are indeed just a warm-up for the main course. Here's where the BMW can show its true qualities. The suspension keeps the 1600 on track, handling smoothly even in the back S. And control of the rear drive car is a sure thing, even while accelerating hard out of the curves. The engine maintains torque and transfers power easily and efficiently to the rear axle with a 40% differential. The four-speed transmission is a series production and leaves nothing to be desired. If you thought a historic touring vehicle like this would be hard to control, you were wrong. The car is amazingly forgiving in extreme conditions. When the rear starts to break loose in a fast curve, a skilled driver can easily catch it and power slide out of the curve at high speed. That enables these two Bavarians to pull off an impressive lap time of just 20.25 seconds. All the more impressive when one considers the 1600 Ti's relatively modest horsepower. Instead of raw power, the BMW aims for the perfect balance of performance and handling. 